we are going to um, conclude uh, uh, the um, discussion regarding the gyroscope, especially looking at the one type of gyroscope so that, that is really widespread uh, over the community uh, since in the last 20 years. The, this kind of gyroscope that we are going to look today is indeed the one that is used in space. Uh, it has been used for different missions, uh, uh, for example, Cassini, uh, but also Messenger, Near. Uh, so as you know, Cassini was a mission that explored the uh, Saturnian system. Messenger uh, was another um, NASA mission that orbited for the first time uh, the planet Mercury from 2011 to 2015. The NEAR mission was uh, before Cassini and Messenger, uh, was indeed uh, uh, focused on the exploration of an asteroid and in that uh, particular mission, the uh, testing of these hemispheric resonating gyroscope was indeed one of the main uh, one of the main objective uh, from the technical point of view, because uh, that technology represented, still represented uh, a novelty technology. So a novelty, a new technology that was, uh, uh, that needed uh, uh, a concrete uh, space uh, technology test. The reason why this uh, uh, gyroscope uh, uh, indeed uh, had uh, a really great success in the last years, is uh, basically re related to the main uh, to the to the main uh, properties uh, of the gyroscope itself. So the main property is indeed uh, that is a small size, as you can see from uh, this uh, image here. The um, uh, glass shape uh, um, shell that is used uh, uh, to uh, enabled the measurement of these uh, um, sending wave patterns uh, is indeed very small uh, and is uh, the size of uh, a coin. So these uh, properties of course represent a really um, crucial uh, achievement for uh, these uh, gyroscopes uh, uh, technology because of course a small size in space represent a priority. But the other thing that we're going to see today is indeed related to the noise. When we are going to discuss the model of the gyroscope, the noise is indeed uh, one of the main problem. That's the reason why you need auxiliary, uh, other auxiliary sensors to determine accurately the attitude. So you need other sensors to compensate mismodeling introduced by these attitude sensors. The other main property of the resonating gyroscope is indeed the high performance. High performance in terms of mass, because of course, if you have a small size, this is also related to small mass, but also a very small power consumption compared to, for example, laser gyroscopes. So those three main properties of the hemispheric resonating gyroscope represented uh, the uh, main advantage compared to uh, laser gyroscopes. And that's the reason why those missions now in the, uh, for example, inertial uh, mass unit, uh, or uh, so the IMU um, of a spacecraft in which usually you have uh, uh, gyroscopes, uh, but if you, are, you have a mission to Mars, so you also have accelerometers. The reason why are called inertial mass unit is indeed related to the fact that those this package of technologies give information on the spin rate through the gyroscopes and the acceleration, especially and exclusively non-gravitational accelerations, non-conservative acceleration through the accelerometer. So if you have both accelerometers and gyroscopes, these um, tool is also important for orbit navigation, not only for attitude. So usually gyroscope plus accelerometers represents a unit that is important for the attitude orbit control system, the well-known AOCS. 
So said that, yesterday I briefly introduced the, uh, what is the principle of the hemispherical resonating gyroscope. And as I said before, one of the main advantage of laser gyroscopes is, you, is that you don't have any mechanical parts. So the gyroscope don't need any, any mechanical um, components to determine the spin rate of the spacecraft. As we, we, we saw yesterday, you only need the Sagnac effect. So basically the fact that two counterpart beams are rotating along the same path. And by measuring the interference of that light, you are able to determine the angular velocity of the spacecraft. In this case, what you, are, what you have is indeed a mechanical uh, device in the sense that you don't, you don't use the properties of a light beam, but you are using the mechanical property of a glass-shaped shell. That's the reason why I cited the um, work that was done in the 1890s by the physicist Brian, because it is based on the principle that he found out that if you um, so basically induce uh, waves on a glass, one glass, um, these uh, uh, so the, these, uh, uh, the response of the glass is that you have uh, a continuous tone if uh, the glass is still. But if you were starting to uh, rotate the glass around the axis of the stem, what occurs is that you're going to measure um, a different uh, pattern of the standing waves. What I mean is that, uh, for example, uh, okay, great, thanks. So the main uh, uh, advantage of this mechanism is indeed uh, that you are able to uh, to measure the response of the acoustic waves. Uh, when you put in rotation the glass around this axis. Of course, uh, in space, we are not going to measure the acoustic waves. So you have to translate this principle to what you are able to measure in space. So the principle is the same, but was used uh, in the, um, starting from the 1965 to determine, so to use the uh, pattern of uh, these standing waves uh, that you can measure on a shell that is uh, indeed, that has indeed a glass shaped shell. So the principle, as I said, is the same. And uh, it is based uh, on the fact that when you starting rotate uh, this shell around this axis, uh, the Coriolis forces that acting on the rim of uh, these uh, gyroscopes uh, tends to uh, provide a different uh, pattern of the standing waves. Uh, so the response uh, that the uh, actually act on two normal nodes called the antinode and node tends to indeed rotate or more precisely to process because of the rotation of the glass or in this case the this glass shaped shell so if you're starting to rotate this glass shaped shell you're able to see a variation of these patterns around the shell. There is a direct relationship between the rotation that is induced on the shell and the um, evolution, so the precession of the, um, these standing wave due to the Coriolis forces. For given the properties of the shell, for example, you can determine that this relationship, this rate, 
this ratio is about 0.3. So you have a direct relationship between the spin rate that you are inducing and the um, evolution of the standing wave pattern. So the precession of these waves. So what happens is basically, if you have a sensor that is, it is able to measure these uh, uh, standing wave uh, around the shell, you're able to uh, trace how these uh, response is evolving because of the Coriolis forces. And so you're able to directly measure the spin rate at which the uh, shell is moving with respect to the inertial reference frame. So this is a very powerful uh, tool because by using this simple principle, you are able to measure indeed the spin rate of the spacecraft. Because now I made the example that you are rotating the shell. What happens in space is that if the gyroscope is fixed, fixed um, into the spacecraft, if uh, uh, there is a, a rotation um, that you have because of the spacecraft attitude uh, uh, variation, your, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, variation of the spin rate generates these patterns on the shell. And you're able to measure that from your sensors. So we're not going to describe entirely how that um, kind of sensor works, but this principle is that what I said. So uh, this is a repetition of the principle. The only difference is that here you can see how, for example, uh, these uh, glass shape shall respond to the uh, perturbation induced by a rotation of the shell itself. So what happens here is that if you have that the shell is still, you don't have any precession of the standing waves. If the shell is starting to drift, uh, what happens here is that uh, Coriolis forces are generated and these anti-node and node modes tends to have a specific pattern that is related to the uh, angular velocity with respect to the inertial space. As I said, here is reported 0.3. This parameter is related to the gyroscope that you have in space. So the design of uh, that particular um, resonating gyroscope uh, with that material provides this kind of response. Okay, so what, what you have here is that uh, thanks to those materials, you are able to determine this kind of uh, uh, spin rate. The main advantage of uh, hemispherical resonating gyroscope is that uh, you have a very relative stable uh, uh, variations due to, to, temper, uh, to, do, to thermal gradients. So if you have uh, temperature variations in uh, the um, in this uh, uh, mass unit, what happens is that the stability of the response of the gyroscope is very, very, uh, so is very, 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 so you don't have any significant variations. There are questions or. Okay. I think you have to mute your microphone. Okay, thanks. So the you're able to listen uh, multiple uh, lecture, I guess. Okay. So the um, the response of this uh, of this glass, uh, indeed. Uh, is, is really stable uh, with temperature. So what you have here is that the measurements that you get is uh, very uh, reliable. And this is a main advantage. One of the main disadvantages that I forgot to say yesterday regarding the fiber optic gyroscope is that if you have a thermal a temperature or a thermal gradient, uh, temperature variations, the fiber optic material tends to um, basically um, increase in length uh, 
if you have uh, an higher temperature. So what, what happens, uh, the length of uh, the path of the gyroscope increases, uh, and that is uh, represent a strong uh, error sources uh, because what happened is that when we have done the computation of the number of uh, fringes, uh, we have seen that these parameters should be well known. So if you have a thermal gradient in the fiber optic gyroscope, what happened here is that one of the parameters, especially the path, is changing, but you don't know how much that length is changing, so your measurement is significantly affected. So today, what we are going to do next, uh, we are going to introduce uh, the models uh, of uh, errors of gyroscopes. But the source of those errors will be different from gyroscope to gyroscope. As I said, uh, the hemispheric resonating gyroscope usually has uh, lower error sources. And the, uh, so noise, uh, lower uh, noise, because the error sources is different compared to the others or to the other two uh, laser gyroscopes. Here you can find, uh, just for uh, your, uh, I mean, uh, for your more comprehensive understanding of the instrument, the electronic design of the instrument. But as I said, the principle is really simple. So also the electronics, it is uh, uh, not really complicated. And that is one of the other, uh, other advantage of the hemispheric resonating gyroscope. So the three main parts of the gyroscope are a pick-off, resonator, a forcer. The forcer is what is uh, inducing uh, the um, resonating um, vibration on the gyroscope. So of course, what you need to have is that the gyroscope is uh, constantly perturbed by this forcer. And you have a part of the gyroscope that has to measure the precession of the standing waves in the gyroscope in order to determine the spin rate. So the, this final slide is uh, uh, just a recap of what we already said regarding the uh, hemispherical gyroscope. It is related to the um, type of uh, uh, gyroscope that is used in space. Because as I forgot, so basically, as I didn't, um, I didn't say uh, the full story of this gyroscope. But basically, um, the last success of this uh, instrument uh, was made by a spin-off that uh, started in the '90s. Uh, so after trying to um, use uh, this gyroscope in the 80s uh, for different application, uh, in the 90s, uh, these spin-offs tried to use uh, this uh, uh, gyroscope uh, for a space application. And basically now there is uh, this model of uh, uh, reason, uh, hemispheric resonating gyroscope that represent the standard and represent the main application on a different spacecraft. So this is the one that was used, uh, I, I think, on uh, on Messenger, but it's very similar to all the others uh, because, as I said, basically there is one company that uh, pushed that technology um, as at the uh, cutting edge technology in the 90s that now became uh, uh, has become a standard. So the physical characteristics is, are important. Uh, so the first row is in inches. If you want to have an idea on how, I mean, the size of, uh, uh, of this instrument is about 30 centimeters. So it is a very compact box in which you have uh, at least three units of these resonating uh, gyroscopes in order to have the three axial measurement of, uh, of the attitude. Usually you have a redundancy, so you have an additional one. And the compact box is given by the fact that each sensor is uh, very small, uh, but you need also the electronics in order to process your measurements. 
As I said, one of the main advantage is uh, the temperature range, temperature range. So what you, uh, what you can see here is that you have a range that goes from minus 40s to almost 80 uh, degrees Celsius. Um, you have uh, these other properties are very specific. So basically are the properties given by vibration. So vibration tolerance, a shock that are probably too in detail for this course. Um, the characteristic, as I said, can be used in space, but also on uh, terrestrial application like airplanes and everything else. But the main part that I would like to focus on and will be the next part of uh, these, uh, um, uh, this lecture is indeed uh, the um, determination of the noise or better, the performances of the gyroscopes. As I said, these gyroscopes represent, uh, I mean, the main technology used in the last years because these performances are definitely higher compared to the other gyroscopes. Especially what we are going to see is the angle random walk and the, uh, okay, also the angle white noise, uh, there are two kinds, but also the, uh, what is called the, the rate random walk. Here for you represent only numbers uh, without any important meaning. What we are going to discuss in the next and final part of the gyroscope is uh, exactly, is to explain uh, indeed the gyroscope noise. And uh, those numbers uh, will have much more sense for you at the end of that part. The only thing that you have to remember now is that these gyroscopes have higher performances compared to the others. And that's the reason why are used. Okay, so what we are going to introduce uh, is uh, what is called the Farenkopf gyro noise model. This, is, this represents one of the standard model of the gyroscope noise model, but you can find in literature other kind of models. The parameters that we are going to introduce are basically equal in all models that you can find in literature. The only thing that could change is the name of those parameters. That's the reason why it is important that from this part, you are not going to remember exactly the name of each perturbation or each error source. The, the main important part is that you know that each parameter corresponds to a physical property of the noise model. To start, what we are trying to do is to determine what is your uh, readout from your instrument? So what the instrument is giving you. Of course, uh, what we want to measure is the angular velocity, the spin rate, omega i. So if the instrument was perfect, those terms are zero. So your gi is exactly equal to omega i. In uh, real cases, this is not true, of course. So we have to introduce, uh, also let me introduce one term at a time. So let's assume that those are zero. The first term that we can introduce uh, is indeed uh, the electronic noise. The electronic noise is usually uh, only perturbing, is only uh, basically a scale factor of your readout. So when the uh, gyroscope is going to measure omega i, it's not going to measure only uh, this uh, parameter, but this uh, uh, measurement is affected by a scale factor ki that is a function of uh, the uh, electronic uh, electronics of the system. So this is the electronics uh, of the system. So the main problem here is not uh, knowing which is the source of uh, these uh, 
of these electronic noise. The main problem here is how to model that because we Okay, we, we can say that this one is indeed the electronic noise and represent the scale factor. What we, are, what we need to do is to know when we are going to measure omega i at a different instant of time, we need to know um, what is the uh, parameter that we should expect from the electronic noise. That's the reason why the statistics here is the key part. So we need to know statistically what is the uh, expected electronic noise that we know. So usually, as it is written here, the electronic noise is modeled as white noise. However, the electronic noise usually is colored noise. What mean what is what those two terms mean? White noise means, uh, as we are going to see later, that when you do this is the uh, power spectrum. So you have in your x-axis uh, the frequency f, and on your y-axis the power spectral density. When you have uh, white noise, these uh, uh, the power spectrum. So uh, how much uh, um, power you have at each frequency is constant for all the frequencies. So you don't have any um, direct uh, dependency of that power spectrum from the frequency. So from the frequency. So what we are doing here is that the white noise means that we don't have any uh, basically any dependency from the frequency of the measurement that we are doing. In reality, color noise means that uh, the uh, this K here is a response of the electronics at different sampling rate. So if you're trying to measure or uh, to read out the omega, for example, at 100 Hertz or 200 Hertz, this K would change. What we are assuming here is that the uh, behavior of the instrument is almost the same for all the frequency. So that's the reason why what we are meaning here is that white noise, uh, you can uh, determine uh, this electronic noise uh, as, as I said uh, yesterday or the day before with the Gaussian distribution with a certain sigma, a certain mean, here I assumed mean equal to zero, so you have, uh, you, you, by doing uh, laboratory testing, you can have an idea on how this uh, Ki will uh, is, uh, okay? However, you will find out that this term is not really the main term of, uh, um, of your uh, Farenkov model. The other term that we have to uh, take into account is the initial bias. But the initial bias is directly related to the BI, what is called the uh, float torque derivative noise, this one. But before going to these two terms, we have uh, a final term uh, that is eta. So let's uh, discuss that in uh, in order that is uh, written in the slide. So eta i1, it is called the float torque noise. As I said, the, the terminology here is uh, relative to this Farenkov general model. What we are going to see that uh, in general, uh, this uh, eta i1 is called uh, can also be called and usually is called in um, in other studies also angular random walk. Okay, so what we are going to see in the next slide that is also called angular random walk. So this uh, noise uh, is also modeled as 
white noise, but here represent a rate white noise. So it is white noise in frequency. We're going to see what I mean later. So we are assuming that for frequency, the, uh, the response of this eta i is almost equal for all frequency. So we can have another, another Gaussian distribution that is, that is superimposed to the gyro drift rate. That is this one. So this eta i1 is called also or float torque noise or angular random walk. But the real random walk that we have to be careful about, it is, so this is, sorry to be so slow. It is, but it is important because I, we need to introduce this acronym ARW that is also found in the next slide. So you know what it means later. The other term is BI and B, uh, BI0 and BI. So BI0 represents an initial bias. So what it means is that you know that your measurement is always affected by an offset and uh, doesn't have uh, really uh, a statistic distribution. Usually is a constant bias that you are able to measure when you want to calibrate your instrument. The other main term is BI. BI is evolving over time. So if BI0 can be assumed to be not constant over time, but is a bias, so every time we'll have a different value. BI is a very function, is a function of time. and is indeed called the float torque derivative noise. Represent our drift rate ramp. It is fundamental because these uh, term here cause uh, the drift of the uh, accelerometer. So usually when you look at those kind of instruments, you have uh, one parameter that is called bias and the other one is called drift. Drift means uh, that is a bias that is um, evolving over time. So you have, uh, for example, let's do another plot here. that at a certain time, that is also true for accelerometers or other kind of instrument, your uh, measurements is affected by BEO. So what it means that for omega equal to zero, you have a readout. So your instrument is biased. It's the same thing that you have when you're trying to, uh, for all kinds of instruments. BI is indeed uh, a drift, but it's not a linear drift as you are able, basically, see, yeah, we have seen uh, usually in other uh, courses of instruments. Usually it's a random walk. So basically, you don't have uh, a, a distribution of, uh, uh, of these. Um, so basically, it's a stochastic variation uh, of, uh, the, uh, of the bias. So the, you have, uh, uh, a random walk that varies over time uh, with uh, a specific uh, behavior that is not uh, uh, and that is not really uh, very easy to be uh, predictable. So you have this random walk that you have to be careful about. That's the reason why, as we said, uh, star trackers, sun sensors. Sì, prego. Sì, ho una domanda, ma Quindi questo, questo random walk che, che ha disegnato ha, ha intenzionalmente disegnato il fatto che si discosti tendenzialmente dall'andamento lineare a causa sia de, della parte de, derivativa che della parte, eh, diciamo, che, che è da I. Intendo dire ci sta una parte oscillante. No. Ok, no, no. E poi ci sta pure una parte con una pendenza diversa, insomma. No, okay, so the question is why uh, in this plot I uh, drew the, um, I mean that the random walk is so different compared to the linear variation. Because as we are going to see next, uh, this uh, bi has a, a specific variation over time that is given by another parameter that is called eta2. 
So eta two is always uh, um, is also another parameter that we're going to see cannot be modeled as a white Gaussian noise, but we'll have uh, uh, a variation that will vary over, over with the frequency. So that's the reason why I wrote this uh, indeed random walk because the response of the instrument corresponds to the variation of eta two that is not constant. And so your variation of the B over the T is not linear. So I anticipated what I'm going to discuss in the next slides. The main point here is that this BI, if you want to have an instantaneous determination of BI, you have to use your other instruments to determine and to characterize the noise of the gyroscope. Uh, for example, uh, you can use uh, star triggers uh, that enables uh, not only the estimation of the attitude, but as I said uh, in the previous days, you can also determine the parameters of the model of the gyroscope, as we're going to see uh, tomorrow with the extended common filter. So to reply to the question regarding the evolution of the, uh, um, the random walk, uh, um, we are, here we introduce a simpler model of, uh, of the, of the Farenkopf gyros uh, noise. So what we are going to do here is that we are starting from the previous model that I wrote before, but specifying that uh, the B indeed is evolving over time with another function, eta2. And this eta2, as uh, for eta1, it is called uh, rate random walk. So this is the rate rate random walk. So is RRW. Sorry, but let me write down because this is important. Random walk. Ma scusi una domanda. Quindi B1 diciamo si può chiamare anche random walk direttamente? Oltre... So it is called... Sorry, can you repeat because I was muted. Eh, la B, B1 e B, B si può chiamare anche random walk, quindi invece di... B? Sì. Uh, random walk, so the question is uh, if B can be also called... Uh, as I said, B in the Farenkopf model is called a flow torque derivative noise. I know it is a really complicated name. Random walk is uh, related to the uh, behavior of this parameter. So is not really uh, a, a correct terminology. You have to be careful that in principle, uh, as uh, I mean, you are describing how it is evolving, you're not indeed referring to the correct name. So if you want to talk it, you, about B, it is called indeed a flow torque derivative noise. But if you call it BI and you describe it correctly, that is the important thing that, that you have to know. If you want to describe in a different terms, uh, that is uh, basically your drift. The problem with drift, uh, so drift rate ramp, for example. The problem with the drift is that usually drift can also be misleading because you have basically the, um, you can also have uh, the linear drift. So you have to be careful that you can describe it uh, as uh, a rate, uh, so a drift rate ramp uh, that is described with a random walk process. But as I said, the terminology is relatively important. The important thing is the concept that is behind that. Um, so, sì, sì prego. Ma ora stiamo trattando di vettori perché stiamo tenendo conto de, di tutte le misurazioni fatte. E so we are okay, yes, true. So I, I, I forgot to say that, for example, from this equation to this equation, 
here we are talking about each element, so each measurement. And when you have uh, the vectors, uh, you are uh, indeed uh, considering that you have, you have different uh, uh, measurement uh, uh, that you included in a vector, yes. So the, the other important thing that you have to take into account is that usually you have to uh, consider that G is useful in the OBF reference frame and not in the uh, gyroscope reference frame. So you have a transformation matrix G that is known. That is the transformation matrix from D. So your G here is the rotation matrix from your GCF. So the gyroscope reference frame that has a similar expression to the sensor reference frame to the OBF, okay? I think that in our cases, we are going to find a way to uh, simplify this case. So don't be particularly scared about that. But in principle, when you have uh, the, um, when you have uh, the measurement, so basically what happened is that uh, this uh, is the final, uh, readout of your gyroscope that is measured in the GCF. What you need to do is to report this measurement to the OBF, to the optical bench frame or to the body reference frame even better. Okay. So don't be, uh, I mean, th those are also reported here regarding the measurement of omega x, omega y, omega z uh, in uh, the, um, with uh, respect to the error angles, but it's not really important. So you can also ignore that. We, we are trying to only look at the uh, different measurements. What we are going to discuss tomorrow is how to use, for example, uh, uh, this model in the estimation of each parameter. And so if we want to use the extended common filter. So as we said, the K is the scale factor, B0 is the initial bias, B is the slowly varying bias, eta, eta 1 is the white noise on gyro rate, and eta 2 we can assume here that is also white noise. In reality, eta 2 is not really uh, white noise, but as we can see later, as indeed a variation, uh, so it is a colored noise and we would change with respect to uh, the frequency. Before going to, um, so I would uh, have a break in uh, a couple of minutes. So the only thing that I would like to, do, to, to let you know, to conclude this part is that, um, this uh, uh, simplified Farenkov gyro model can be indeed uh, only summarized with this expression here. So as you can see, the scale factor K can be ignored because it is a small uh, error compared to B and eta one. But also you can remove uh, BI zero because as I said, if you calibrate your instrument, you are able to determine the uh, the bias every time. These expressions in the statistical point of view is the definition of eta1 and eta2 as white noise uncorrelated. So it means that uh, you have uh, a mean of this white noise equal to zero and the correlation between the two is equal to zero. So those two error sources, one it is directly acting on your measurement, the other one acting on the derivative of the bias, is indeed equal to zero. So those two terms have uncorrelated function. And if you are able to do that, you're able to determine the variance of the, these two terms by uh, determining the sigma of the two measurements. As we are going to see after the break, this is uh, an approximation because as I said, eta one is called the ARW, your angular rate W. 
uh, angular random walk. The other one is the RRW. So usually the RRARW, so this uh, angular rate uh, walk, um, random walk, uh, is indeed uh, a Gaussian, uh, is indeed uh, white. The other one uh, as a function of the frequency. But let's uh, restart that uh, after the break. So let me pause the video here. This slide represents indeed uh, the uh, simplified Farenkov gyros model. And uh, what we need to do here is uh, to try to have uh, a simplified model of uh, the noise source. Uh, as we said, uh, unfortunately, okay, here it is. Uh, let me rewrite down, but we have said uh, that eta1 is also called the IRB, so the angular random walk, and this is the, um, the rate random walk. I'm trying to write that multiple times because the next plots could be a little bit uh, tricky to be understood. Okay, so what it is important here is that we are assuming that eta1 and eta2 have a mean equal to zero, are completely fully uncorrelated. So if you do the product, the correlation between the two, it is zero. And if you try to determine the standard deviation, you can determine directly the sigma of eta1 and eta2. As I said, in reality, eta2 is, so let's look at the eta2 in the frequency domain. So the frequency domain of the sampling rate, but also in the omega domain. So the, uh, what we have here basically. So the uh, contribution of eta one and eta two in the measurement of omega. So eta two is a white noise. So it is assumed, sorry, eta one is assumed to be a, a white noise. So you have a power spectrum that is flat as a function of uh, the frequency. You have a dependency with uh, one over uh, F squared for the, the RRV, RRW, so the rate random walk. So the angular random walk uh, has this uh, expression and this one is indeed related to the frequency. So you have uh, this trend here. Uh, the other, uh, if you want to translate uh, this power spectrum in the angle domain, so basically this omega is your readout of your measurement, so you know that omega t is equal of the angular variation of the spacecraft, for example, theta. These two terms uh, will have uh, these uh, different uh, um, behavior in frequency if you are looking in the angle domain. This is only for your knowledge, it's not really important for the course. But if you have the white, uh, white random noise uh, for the uh, angular random walk in the, uh, for omega, that reflects to uh, a function of one over uh, F squared in the uh, angle variation of the spacecraft. But as I said, although in reality these two terms are, this is colored and this is white, we are assuming that both eta1 and eta2 are both white. So both have a flat behavior with respect to the frequency. So what we do here, if we want to determine sigma u squared, we have to multiply by f squared k squared divided by f squared in order to remove the dependency of the power from the frequency. So basically, uh, at the end, uh, you will be able to determine the sigma u as the uh, integral of this k squared, that is a property of, uh, of the gyroscope. And for the angular IRV, RRW, this is also, this is, is already uh, a Gaussian distribution, so you are able to determine the integral over the frequency so what it means that your sigma 
is indeed the uh, area underneath this line. And in order to determine the area, uh, the sigma for this function, you have to multiply by f squared in order to uh, whitening your uh, error source, to have this uh, error as a white uh, noise. The, um, so what is the range of frequency that you have to consider, for example, your integration? You have to consider F1 and F2 that are F1, the frequency at which you want to have your measurement. And F2 is the sampling rate. So uh, if, you want to if you want to have a readout from the sampling rate of the angular velocity, usually F2 is definitely larger than the rate at which you want to have your measurement. So for example, you want to have a measurement every one eighth of second, and you want to have uh, that the sampling rate is uh, uh, 100 times uh, uh, every second. So you do this integral, you can determine the two sigmas. So you can do something similar in the angle domain, but I will remove this slide, so you will not have in your in uh, in the package that I will upload on the internet because it is too much, I guess. So. The only feed that you have to remember is that usually you are looking at the omega. Uh, this is important uh, if you want to um, understand what is the, uh, since uh, at the end what you want to determine is the angular variation of the spacecraft. Uh, these uh, give you an idea on how the, the error of the gyroscopes uh, is um, basically inflating the, um, so it is uh, perturbing the, your knowledge of uh, the angle of the spacecraft theta. So that's the reason why it is not really necessary for our purpose because what we are going to you, what we want to do is to determine directly omega. So we want to see which is the effect of beta 1 and beta 2 in our readout of the gyroscope, okay? So let's focus uh, on, up to here. And also the other, the other two I don't think are important. So I would stop here for the, the gyroscope. But if you want to, um, if you want, so I will remove that package from the slides because uh, if you want to have additional explanation, uh, what uh, it is uh, presented here is that you have uh, indeed uh, um, an additional, uh, so basically what is the effect of your gyroscope errors in your angle variation of the angular variation of the spacecraft. The other part is related especially on the misalignment of the gyroscopes. So in case if you have uh, uh, possible misalignment of the gyroscope model. Uh, this is an additional uh, problem that I don't want to um, I don't want to treat in this course. But uh, you have to keep in your mind that not only you have this model given by the different error sources, but you can also have additional terms given by the fact that your gyroscope has some misalignment. And uh, when you try to determine, uh, for, to correct your gyroscope errors, uh, measurements, uh, what you need to do is also to uh, determine, for example, the alignment of the gyroscope. So since I would like to present, to give you an example of extended common filter, what we are going to deal tomorrow is especially and only to the uh, error sources of, due to the random walk, uh, of the rate, so the uh, of the drift, and uh, eta one that is the, the the torque, the flow torque noise. Okay, so those the are two main problem, and if you want to call them with a different terminology that you can find uh, better, it is indeed that eta one is called the angular rate random walk, and this is the rate random walk. Okay, so. Professore, prego, prego. In questi, nei due grafici dove c'è lo spettro di potenza, potrebbe spiegare meglio qual è la differenza tra i due grafici? 
Sì, so. perché so, sopra vedo Angular Rate PSD, che non, non so cosa voglia dire, e poi Angular, che se c'è cos'è. Yes, so this, this plots, uh, so the question is uh, uh, the, the meaning of uh, each plot. So the, these two plots, uh, uh, I mean, the PSD is written here, is uh, the power spectral density. The, um, these two plots um, are based on two realistic cases. So what you have to focus on, uh, since I'm, I said that this uh, second plot is not really treated in the course because uh, it is uh, something that you can determine afterwards. So if you focus on this one, this is uh, the power spectrum. So the error, uh, so the power spectrum associated by each error at uh, each frequency. So it is uh, directly the uh, effect of beta 1 and beta 2 on your omega. That's the reason why you can find here S omega. So it is uh, the response of your uh, error uh, given by each specific uh, uh, angular rate. So basically what it means is that since uh, eta 1 and theta 2 are directly affecting your measurement g, eta 1 is directly related to omega. And so you have uh, this uh, white noise uh, distribution because we are, we are assuming that uh, eta 1 is uh, the uh, angular random walk. The second line in this plot is given by the fact that eta2 is a random walk, uh, is a white Gaussian noise, but is, uh, if you want to relate eta2 in the domain of omega, you know that you have a partial derivative of b with respect to t. So what it means here is that if you want to determine what is the power spectrum in the omega domain, so the, your measurement uh, omega, you have uh, this white Gaussian distribution, so this uh, uh, flat distribution over the frequency for eta1. So this is your eta1. Eta2, that now probably is a little bit clear to you, eta2, is not directly related to, to omega, but is uh, related through the derivative of uh, uh, the temporal derivative of, uh, the, of B. That's the reason why when you try to determine what is the effect of uh, the uh, eta2 in your measurement omega, you have an additional term that depends on the frequency. Because what you have to do here is to determine uh, in the frequency domain which is, what is the effect of beta 2 in this, in this plot here. Capito. Grazie. Ma invece okay. sigma u e sigma v? Sigma u and sigma, so sigma u and sigma v, so basically what it means here, okay, is that, so both errors have a Gaussian distribution, so means that you have, uh, you are, we are assuming that their means are equal to zero, and this is uh, the fact that those error sources are uncorrelated, so are error sources that don't have anything in common. The last two equation means that, that we are assuming that both models, so the if this is eta1, you have a Gaussian distribution of this with sigma u, sigma v for eta1. Okay, this is for eta1. And this is eta2. Another Gaussian distribution, let's do, for example, that is a narrow Gaussian distribution. So a smaller sigma, I'm assuming, but it's not really true. So this is sigma u for eta 2. The problem is that 
is the uh, dependency of beta one with the G. So you know that eta one is directly related to omega. So when you're looking at the power spectrum with respect to omega, you have indeed the, uh, this uh, uh, flat behavior. In case of uh, eta two, you have to pass through uh, a variation. So a derivative, the temporal derivative of B respect, respect to time. So the temporal derivative of B, and so your wide Gaussian distribution will be in the omega domain, will be given by f squared. So that's the reason why when you want to determine your omega, you have to take into account that sigma u squared is the uh, variance of eta. So what it means that you have to pass from the temporal domain, from the time domain to the frequency domain. Okay, so you have to do the transformation in order to convert that power spectrum in this one. And uh, so this is basically uh, the reason why I would like to stop here because afterwards, uh, so the second plot that you have on the other side is uh, an additional transformation. So you need to recompute uh, an additional transformation from the frequency domain to the temporal domain because you're not mapping the error in omega, but you're mapping the error of the ang angular variation of the space theta. That from my point of view is definitely outside the scope of the course. So what you need to know is indeed that one, okay? Because that, that is the important thing that you have to know. So this, uh, we are assuming that the eta one and the eta two are both Gaussian, but since the eta two, in order to be in the omega domain has to be transformed to a time, probably, uh, to a time derivative, you have this dependency with the, with, the, uh, with the frequency squared. And that's the reason why what we want in order to determine sigma, the sigma is given by the area that is uh, uh, underneath each line. That's the reason why you do the integral of this power. Uh, this is, for example, the error that you have for the case that we presented in, in the previous plot. This is important because when you know these RRW and ARW, when you have a gyroscope, what you want to compare is indeed the performance in terms of these two. So let's go back to what we have done for the uh, hemispherical um, resonating gyroscope. Here it is, you find the angle random walk uh, and the angular rate uh, range. So there is not, uh, for example, here, I'm surprised that it's not the rate uh, random walk, but for example, this is also very important. So you can compare this performance with the performance of the common fiber optic gyroscope. What you can find is that this value is definitely smaller than the one for fiber optic gyroscope. This is really small, for example, compared to the fiber optic gyroscope. It is because, as I said, uh, fiber optic gyroscopes are affected by uh, thermal uh, gradients, so the length of the optical coil, uh, optical, um, yes, the fiber optic coils can change. So the, the meaning of these slides is indeed how to characterize the noise of the gyroscope. Anyway, if you have other questions, I, I understand that you, can, um, you, you will need a little bit more time to fully uh, understand what I mean here. Uh, anyway, so let's go to the final two sensors because we need to conclude this part. So today we're going to introduce, uh, uh, almost conclude also the Earth Horizon sensors and we are going to do also the sun sensors. Uh, probably early uh, next week. Let's see tomorrow how the uh, lecture will be, but I'm pretty sure that we are going to focus only on the extended common filter and uh, uh, an exercise in MATLAB that we're going to show you. So the last two sensors that we are going to introduce are a little bit different compared to the star sensors. 
because the main advantage of star sensors is, the, is indeed that you are able to look at the celestial bodies that can be approximated to a point. Although when you have a CCD, you are able to map the size of the object that you are looking at, but usually those sizes are so small that you don't need to care about the shape of the celestial body itself. For the Earth and the Sun, this is not the case because, of course, usually you use a sensor if you are in orbit around the Earth. So you have not a point, but you have a disk that is really related to the properties of the Earth itself. Similar thing for the Earth, for the Sun because you, the Sun you can use you can use sun sensors for in the solar system, uh, especially if you go closer, because uh, of course you're able to look at the sun with um, better accuracy. But you don't, you're not able to look at the sun as a point, but you have to take into account is this shape. And so there are different uh, uh, stars, uh, sun sensors that enable the measurement of the sun direction. So the main point here is indeed uh, starting from the earth sensors uh, is that you are not able to provide for example easily as we have done for uh, for the sun sensor a vector w would, would not make much more sense so the technique that we are going to use for the earth sensor is a bit different and is related to the technology of the sensor itself. So that, that will be clear probably uh, tomorrow morning or uh, early next week. Uh, but today, what I would like to start with is with the technology that we need to you to have in order to 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 design an Earth horizon sensors. As you can see from here, um, what you have is that the earth sensor is also called earth horizon sensors so the main thing here is that we are not trying to determine a vector w that is pointing from our from our uh, spacecraft to the celestial body but we are trying to look at the horizon of the earth what i mean here is that this is the Earth, this is your spacecraft. So this, the Earth seen by the this, this spacecraft is this disk here. So what you're going to look at especially is the horizon, so the uh, rim of this disk. And uh, you need to design an instrument that enables the scanning of this disk. That's the reason why, as I said, you have to be careful that W is not really the vector that we're going to see. We are going to see that Earth sensor can be easily used to determine directly the attitude of the spacecraft for the roll and pitch axis. So that will be pretty straightforward. Uh, so that's the reason why it is called horizon sensors. So the main disadvantage, so the main problem, if you're looking at the Earth disk, so look only to this disk, that is the Earth seen by the spacecraft. What you have here is that you have to consider that this disk is uniform. So what you're looking at is uh, to uh, a disk that has a uniform uh, properties. So one, one of the questions could be, okay, let's put the camera and try to measure its albedo in order to determine the uh, horizon of the Earth. That approach would not work because if you're looking to the visible light, so the albedo, the uh, sunlight reflected by the Earth, that response of the surface of the Earth would be very different from the uh, portion of the Earth that, that you are looking at. So if you are looking at, for example, the North Pole, you are looking at very uh, bright fissures, as for example, the polar deposits, in which you have high albedo of 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 
because the uh, eyes of the Arctic indeed is very reflective. But if you are, for example, looking at a region in which you have uh, a very uh, dense vegetation that would have a very low albedo, and so your disk will be completely different. So your disk, uh, so your disk of the Earth will not be a disk with a uniform color here, but will be with a darker region here, a darker region here, and so on. And you want to avoid that, because since we are trying to look at the horizon, we want to have uh, that this rim here is uh, definitely well defined. So that's the reason why the Earth sensors are looking at the infrared emission of the planet. So basically, since uh, the temperature of the Earth is uh, uh, quite uniform in, uh, I mean, emit, emit a radiation, a thermal radiation is quite uniform for each uh, place, you use uh, this uh, um, frequency range in order to determine, indeed, a disk that is uniform. So you are using sensors that are looking at the infrared rather than the albedo. To measure that, what you are doing here is to try to look at the different wavelength of the infrared spectrum and see what is the emission that you have from the planet. What you can see here is that there are you don't have a uniform, a tight uniform uh, response of, uh, of, of the planet, but you have some absorption lines in which uh, basically the emitted uh, radiation of the planet is absorbed by some constituents of the atmosphere. So, for example, at seven microns wavelength, you have that the water vapor is absorbing the radiation. Uh, you have that the ozone, O3, has a very uh, high absorption at those wavelength nine. But you can see that uh, at these uh, 14, 16 microns, you have a uniform uh, absorption due to the carbon dioxide. So the CO2 indeed give you at those, at those wavelength a, a disk that indeed will be completely uniform, although will not totally uniform, but uh, the source of errors were, are completely limited. So what you have uh, indeed that when you're trying to look at the earth, you are able to define this rim accurately. The other problem with Earth horizon sensors is that since you're looking at an object close by, you have also to take into account its shape. So uh, you know that the Earth is not a spheroid, so you don't have uh, that the radius of the planet is equal in all region, but you have a different radius at the equator and the, the poles. So you have a difference of about 22 kilometers. And you have to take into account uh, that in order to determine the flattening. The flattening is indeed uh, what uh, measures the, so if you are looking, for example, this is the North Pole and this is the, you have uh, this uh, flat, uh, so of, for, of course it is extra exaggerated, uh, oblate uh, body. So this is RP and our equator. So the, uh, so the flattening of the body is important because give you an idea, it give you uh, quantify directly what is uh, the flattening, so how the body is oblate. So your computation will be important. So if you want to look at different latitudes, for example, you can determine the radius of the planet by using this very easy formulation. That is, of course, you have to also take into account usually to the topography because you have also mountains or so on, for example. But assuming that you are ignoring the topography, um, if you want to determine the radius of the planet here, 
test the relationship that you have. So it is a function of the equatorial radius and the flattening gives you in terms of the latitudinal uh, uh, dependency. So in terms of the latitude, how the R here, this is R, is given at certain lambda, okay? So when you have to do that, you have to take into account that your R is dependent on your lambda and H is the altitude of the spacecraft with respect to the, uh, to the Earth. Okay, well, uh, the, what we want to uh, look at here is indeed the uh, design of these instruments. So as we said, the Earth horizon sensor the main goal is to determine the horizon. So what is the, the rim of the disk that you are looking at underneath your spacecraft? So what you can do is, is if you're observing this disk from above is to determine uh, an instrument that is able to scan indeed uh, this uh, uh, earth horizon so for the the three uh, the four main parts of this instrument will be the optical filter that enables to um, that allows to uh, filter only the radiation given by the thermal. So for example, that will be from 14 to 16 microns. So only that wavelength will pass through the uh, sensor, okay? After that, you will have a lens that concentrate the focus the um, received the signal from ground to the sensor that is your bolometer however this uh, if you are not including this rotating prism you are able to see only the uh, field of view that is given by uh, this region here what you want to do is to provide a scan of the horizon. So you include a rotating prism that the focus what you are looking at in order to rotate this prism around this axis. And so you are able to scan basically the rim of your field of view. Okay, so basically a sort of path that is like that. Of course, uh, the um, properties of the rotating prism give you this uh, field of view here. The angle eta that is given by the properties of the rotating prism give you the uh, region of the earth that, the, that you are looking at. Afterwards, there is a, a better plot. So let's assume that you have a satellite that is orbiting earth with uh, the XB and YB that are the body reference frame. And you're assuming that you want to have uh, that this body, so these satellites is going to move uh, uh, close to uh, his uh, um, orbital reference frame. So you have that XB is very close to your roll axis. And so that's the reason why you have phi. And your um, YB body is going to be close to your theta axis. So your, to your pitch axis. What you can demonstrate is that the uh, Earth horizon sensors are only able to determine the uniquely the uh, orientation of roll and pitch axis of a spacecraft. As you can imagine, since we are looking only at a single body, we are not able to provide a three-dimensional uh, 
position of the spacecraft, but you can determine two of the, of the orientation of the spacecraft. It are the angle phi, phi and the angle theta, theta. So you can see that eta here report what I have showed here. So this can region. So you have, for example, that your sensor has a bore site that is aligned to the YB axis. Okay. So this is the disk of the Earth that I uh, drew before. This is the roll axis uh, that is also uh, close to your XB axis and your pitch axis is this dashed line here. What happened here is that uh, you had a vertical uh, reference uh, that is uh, this point here that give you uh, the vertical reference. Uh, so look at this one. Uh, this one uh, is definitely really misleading, but if you look at this vertical reference, so it means that the instrument here has a vertical reference uh, that is a vertical axis that is known uh, and is fixed uh, with respect to the bolometer. So if uh, this uh, system rotates, uh, also this vertical axis is rotating. Same thing here. Why it is important to have a vertical axis of the instrument? Because uh, basically what happened here is that the instrument is going to scan uh, this portion of the sky. In this case, uh, it will start to see the Earth signal from here, so from point one, to point two, when the scan is going to leave the Earth disk. So the uh, detector, the bolometer, is going to measure delta 2 and delta 1 at point 1 and point 2 and point 1. So the entire period at which the bolometer is collecting data, so delta 2 minus delta 1, is indeed the um, is indeed uh, the uh, related to the to the roll axis. Indeed, uh, if you rotate your spacecraft around this axis here, this uh, intersection point one and two will uh, rotate. If you are rotating in this direction, as I as I drew here, this one and two will go from here to here and to here, to here. So you will have that this E will become lower. So you are able to measure the roll axis by indeed determine that. The, uh, the main problem here is that the E, so this region here, depends on where the spacecraft is, because if the spacecraft is at a very high altitude, the uh, the size of this disk will be different, will be lower. So in order to determine uniquely the roll axis, you have not only measure delta one and delta two, but you need to know this E zero. And E zero depends directly on the altitude of the spacecraft. So if you want to determine the roll pitch axis of the spacecraft by one single star earth right on sensor, you need to know the altitude. So one Earth sensor give you the uh, roll, so the phi and the theta angle only if H, the altitude of the spacecraft is known is known. Okay. And uh, is known because this parameter is zero is known. The other thing that I will conclude now is that in order to determine the pitch axis, 
you have to include uh, this uh, vertical dashed line uh, here in order to determine uh, the portion of this region here that is given by the left side of your vertical uh, uh, with respect to your vertical reference h1 and your right side the reason why you have here that the pitch angle depends from delta 1 plus delta 2 is because these delta 2 and delta 1 are determined with respect to the vertical reference okay so if you have this vertical reference you are also able to determine the pitch axis if you don't have this vertical reference so remove uh, this uh, dashed line you're not able to determine the pitch angle because if the spacecraft is rotating around this axis what you have here is that the uh, response delta one delta two will be exactly the same and you don't have any reference to determine the pitch that's the reason why you know you need to know a vertical reference also to determine the pitch there is also another problem, and this is the last one that I will, would conclude with, uh, is that uh, you have to be careful that if you rotate your axis uh, by pi, the instrument can have the measurement of uh, uh, one prime and two prime, this one, with a sort of ambiguity. So you have to be careful that one Earth sensor is not really well suited to determine the roll and pitch axis, even if you know the altitude. So the better thing to do is what we are going to see next time. So this, is, this explains what I have said so far. So as I said, you, are, you need to know the altitude in order to determine uh, in zero. You need to determine this one to determine the roll axis. And if you have a vertical reference, you're also able to determine the pitch. Those coefficients are only constants of the instruments, so you don't need to be, uh, you don't, I mean, are properties of the instrument itself. So what we are going to see tomorrow or probably on Monday morning is that you need to know at least two Earth horizon sensors to determine the role of each axis without any ambiguities and without knowing the altitude of the spacecraft. So let's stop here. And uh, for the attitude determination part, we are almost over. We need only to conclude this Earth horizon and the sun sensors. So it will be another part of the lecture. Um, and uh, on uh, next week, we are going to start with the control theory part. Uh, tomorrow, we will dedicate uh, 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 the lectures uh, on the extended command filter and the exercise uh, that show you the differences between the quest algorithm and the extended command filter. Okay, so uh, let me know if you have any questions uh, that I can reply tomorrow and uh, have a good uh, have a good day. Bye bye everyone.